Doug, yeah. Doug, you've got to come and film Seven Days of Science. What? No, I, I, I've got time to film Seven Days of Science. I'm, I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm taking a photo fringe. I'm not I'm allowed. I'm, no, I can't. Come see DNA. And the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. From the 14th to the 19th of August. Or we'll kill Doug. <laughs> Uh, sorry about that. Um, starting off the news this week, physicists at CERN have used data from the Large Hadron Collider, or LHC, to calculate the mass of the Higgs boson to a greater accuracy than ever before. Unlike many other particles of the cosmos, there is nothing in the standard model of physics that gives us a figure for the mass of Higgs boson. Higgs boson is so important because it helps solve a problem physicists had in some of the early stages of understanding quantum physics and how the fundamental forces, specifically weak nuclear force, work in our universe. The official discovery of the particle was at the LHC early last decade, whereas its existence was theorised in the 1960s. The confirmation of its existence has been a massive moment in recent discoveries in physics and was a major goal of the LHC. There is still a lot we don't know about the Higgs boson particle, and determining its mass is another step in allowing us to have a clearer understanding of the fundamental forces. The measurement was taken from the results of two different experiments, both analysing its decay into two different elementary particles. One was of its decay into two high-energy photons, and the other decayed into four leptons. Physicists can now tell the mass of the Higgs boson within a 0.09% precision, using both of these datasets. It's another important step into understanding the many mysteries that surround the building blocks of our universe. And a quick bit of news on a story that happened last week, NASA is thankfully back in contact with the Voyager 2 probe. Sometime in July, an incorrect command sent by the space agency had the probe incorrectly positioned and unable to receive commands from Earth. It was originally expected that the probe would get back in contact with Earth sometime in October, but a powerful signal, described as an interstellar shout, managed to reach the probe and correct its orientation to restore communication to Earth. Of course, they took over a day and a half to find out whether the signal had worked, as Voyager 2 is so far away from Earth, billions of miles. Good news for our interstellar hopes then, which are due to run out of power sometime after 2025. And in the paleontology news this week, we've got a very interesting new paper finding that a relative of ichthyosaurs which lived during the Triassic was a filter feeder like modern baleen whales. Hubasuchus is a basal ichthyosauromorph, meaning it's a member of the lineage leading to ichthyosaurs, but is not a true ichthyosaur itself, and it's known from a few fossils found in China that date to the early Triassic. Since it was named back in 1972, there has been quite a lot of debate over its diet, but now two newly described specimens have revealed a lot more of its skull anatomy and show something very intriguing. Applying a morphometric analysis to the skulls and comparing them to many other animals, paleontologists have found a great deal of convergence between Hubasuchus and modern-day filter-feeding baleen whales. Teeth are completely absent in the reptile, the upper jaws are unfused, a space is present between the premaxillary bones, and certain grooves are present along the jaw margins, just like baleen whales. The space and the unfused bones would have enabled Hubasuchus to expand its buccal cavity, one of the main requirements for filter feeding with the mouth as it allows it to take in a lot of water. Incredibly, those grooves along the jaws, as well as bulges present along them, seem to resemble the bony correlates for baleen found in modern whales, leading the paleontologists to suggest that Hupasuchus probably did have some sort of soft tissue baleen analogue in its jaws to enable filter feeding. No such soft tissues are preserved in the fossils unfortunately, but the presence of these grooves and bulges is very good evidence that they were there. Hupasuchus is inferred to have been a continuous ram feeder, more like bowhead and grey whales than the lunge feeding rockhauls, as it had a very rigid body and thickened ribs, suggesting a slow swimming speed, which contrasts with an older study supporting lunge feeding behaviour in the reptile. 
Hubisuchus is known to have inhabited a restricted lagoonal environment, and this is where its fossils have been found. And it appears that in the absence of fish and large insects to feed on in this environment, these reptiles evolved to take advantage of much smaller prey in the form of zooplankton. This is an absolutely fascinating discovery, showing how reptile lineages were recovering from the great dying at the end of the Permian and adapting to all kinds of different niches. Also in the paleontology news this week is the amazing discovery of the oldest ever free-swimming jellyfish fossil. The paper explains how other proposed macro fossils representing the free-swimming medusa stages of the jellyfish group, properly termed medusazoans, from South China and Utah are probably members of the comb jelly lineage instead, and that older fossils of medusazoans are all microfossils or tubular in form. So this new species from the famous Cambrian-aged Burgess Shale of British Columbia is now the oldest known definite macroscopic example of a jellyfish medusa stage. Named as Burgesso medusa phasmiformis, the description of this species is based on 182 exceptionally preserved fossils of the organism. The jellyfish have umbrellas that are cuboidal in shape and possess more than 90 tentacles that are quite short and described as finger-like. Looking at the shape of the fossils and using modern jellyfish as analogues, the paleontologist suggests that Burgesso medusa may have been a predator of other animals near the sea floor and used a rowing method of propulsion. In fact, in one of the described specimens there's actually a trilobite and another type of arthropod preserved within the umbrella space, and the paleontologists suggest that if this association is not coincidental, it could indicate that Burgesso medusa was a predator of relatively large and motile animals. So, Burgesso medusa shows that the large free-swimming medusa stage of jellyfish had definitely evolved by the mid-Cambrian probably arising during the Cambrian explosion and adds a lot more data to our understanding of the Medusazoan fossil record. That's it from us this week. Do come along to see the show I'm starring in at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival if you can. It's starring and produced by loads of different people who have helped us out with Seven Days of Science intros and has an amazing all-round cast. The fact that I'm in it aside, I would definitely recommend coming to see it. I do hope you enjoyed Seven Days of Science and we'll see you next week, somehow.